Hey everyone, welcome again to the Suffolk Legal Innovation and Technology Lab's first Wednesday workshops for the Document Assembly Line community. Along with our weekly community meetings, these workshops are part of how we support the community of courts and legal aid organizations, building guided interviews with DocAssemble and the Document Assembly Line tools. Today's topic is building DocAssemble interviews with VS Code, and our expert guest is Jack Adamson. Jack has built the DocAssemble Code Highlighter extension for VS Code and is very active on the DocAssemble Slack group. I'll ask him to introduce himself in a minute. First, this workshop is being recorded and we will share it on our YouTube channel. To find it, just for, just search for Suffolk Lit Lab on YouTube. You can also use the Q&A feature in Zoom to ask questions during the workshop. Chat is also enabled, but please do me a favor and use the Q&A feature for questions so they don't get lost in the chat. And I will call attention to your questions as we go. Guest video is disabled, but since it often helps to share your screen to demonstrate a problem, you can do that. Just wait till we ask you to. Before we dive in, if you're hearing about the Lit Lab or the document assembly line for the first time, head over to SuffolkLitLab.org to see our shiny new website and learn more. Everyone who uses DocAssemble and the document assembly line tools is welcome to attend our weekly community meetings, join our community forum on Microsoft Teams, and attend these workshops. If you'd like to join us, email us at litlab at suffolk.edu and we'll help you get access. And now let's get started. Jack, I know it feels awkward to introduce yourself to a bunch of people who may already know you, but Imagine all the new document assembly line users who might see this on YouTube. So please go ahead, introduce yourself, and then I think you can take it from there. Cool, happy to be here. Uh, so my name is Jack Adamson. Uh, I work for a law firm in central Missouri. I am not an attorney. I, <laughs> uh, I'm i friends with an attorney. And so uh, as part of working here and doing a bunch of tech stuff, we got started on trying to automate documents uh, just to improve our internal law firm productivity. And so that's kind of where I got started. I started using Gavel back when it was still called Documate. Uh, and I cut my teeth on a lot of stuff there early. And then as I kept trying to do more and more and more with it and pushing the boundaries, I ended up just going all the way into DocAssemble and be like, okay, let me just try this myself. And uh, it ended up being far more than I initially anticipated. And I've spent a long time just trying to get my bearings and figure things out again. And generally I'm quite happy with the results, but some things take uh, quite a lot more effort. Uh, so that's straight off, right? It's harder, but then you get more power and you can have better results and you have more control. So doc symbol is pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, so that's where I'm at. That's what I'm doing. Very and cool. then, yeah. And so by trying to use that and use doc symbol, uh, let me see if I have a good example. But um, so I use VS Code, and that was just out of my own personal desire. I was like, hey, I think this would be a cool way to work on these, uh, on all these interview files for DocAssemble. You've got all the YAML files and your modules and everything. And so it ends up being a lot. And I was just like, hey, I think this would be better than trying to just do it in the Playground. Um, Playground's great. It does quite a lot has a lot of cool features in terms of like being able to kind of keep track and get your bearings on things. And I still use it a lot for like its tools. Um, but I prefer using VS Code just to be able to to actually write and manage a lot of the, the interview stuff. Um, VS Code has a lot of cool extensions. It's got neat keyboard shortcuts and stuff you can do to try to speed things up and make your workflow uh, just to make it easier. So um, let me like that and I will show you. So uh, we'll just pick something real quick. So first I'm just gonna show a YAML and we'll just grab, I don't know what's a good one. These are all a mess. Uh, it's always how it goes. Landlord's pretty sane. Um, so the VS Code extension that I wrote, you can come over here and see this guy. So it's in the VS Code store. You can just come in here and download it. Um, I made this because there was no good syntax highlighting for VS Code. If you just use the default YAML, uh, like from Red Hat or whatever, it was really basic. It didn't handle a lot of doc symbol specific features. It didn't handle the Python code blocks and a bunch of stuff like that. And so I was like, hey, it'd be really cool if I had a better way of being able to work on it and kind of tell what I'm doing. And so I very poorly fumbled this together um, and it 
is here. I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm kind of just rolling with it. But anyway, so you make a VS Code extension, fill out some stuff in the package. And then basically what I did was just jam together. Hey, look, take over YAMLs, throw some Mako in, throw some Jinja in. Let's throw some, uh, some Python, throw some YAML, inject the whole thing, mix it all together, and you end up with a VS Code extension that does highlighting. And so in the screenshot I made, you can see the basic like highlighting. This is with the dark theme. And so if you've looked at YAML and VS Code without the extension, you'll know that like it doesn't handle the Mako tags properly right here and stuff. So this is pretty cool being able to actually uh, just keep track of your stuff and see it. So that's the extension. It's free. You can hop on there and grab it. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good, I think, in terms of how it actually, the end result is pretty good. So anyway, so you have that. And then like, here's an interview that I have. And so you can see with the syntax highlighting, right, this code block, like, OK, Python function. And then that's the object with attributes. And then it sees the keyword argument. And so it highlights all the different parts properly. Uh, and so it just makes it look good so that you can actually keep track, right? Here's just a dictionary that I put in here to keep track of these different duration options. And so these are um, text strings, so they're green. This is an integer, so it's orange. Um, and so you have all different stuff, even handles like the comments out. And then if you're wondering, so my VS code, I have an extension and a theme. Let me hide that guy. Uh, so this theme is really cool. Tomorrow, tomorrow night operator mono. What this does is it makes it so that uh, certain keywords will be italicized. And then if you use a font that has um, like cursive or fancy italics, then it makes everything look really, really good. So that is why if you look here in the code block, like this if is italicized. Um, so in code blocks, italicized things kind of have this cursive font. So I'm just using Cascadia code, which is a newer Microsoft font. Um, there's some configuration setting to make sure it does the fancy things. But anyway, I like it because it makes it easier to keep track of reading the different code, right? So here's a, a list comprehension, right? And so the for and the in are italicized. So anyway, those are the little kind of things that make using VS Code easier and better. Um, when you're doing this kind of stuff, it's just like having good syntax highlighting that you're comfortable with and knowing what your colors are and like having a good feel for that. And then just like visual layout, like you can configure VS Code a lot, having good theme. Um, and then, like I said, having a good font, especially one with some of those extra tricks is just something I like a lot. And so that lets me feel like I have more control when I'm writing, you know, some of these YAML files, right, get really, really big. And so having the syntax highlight properly makes a big difference for keeping track of it, right? Even the choices here for this Mako, like it wraps the and colors the tags properly. Um, so yeah, so that is kind of the extension and like why I use VS Code for some setup stuff. Sorry, one sec. Oh, thank you for the links. Um, so for setting some of this up and the way that I'm using it with VS Code. So one of the tricks with VS Code uh, is that if you're using like the playground or something and you make a change on your module in VS Code, it's like, how do I push it into my actual doc symbol? I need to be able to run it. And so um, there is a really, really cool program that Jonathan wrote called doc symbol CLI, which is, sorry, I didn't have it pulled up. But anyway, what it does is it makes it so that it uses the doc assemble uh, API from your server and it pushes packages that you have on your local machine. Hey, thanks. Uh, takes these packages that you have on lo your local machine, lets you push them right into your doc assemble server. So you set up an API key and stuff in your doc assemble server. You can run this and you can do DA install and push your package right onto your server and work on it. And then as he explains further down here, you can also set up uh, using the playground option. So DA install playground. 
this is really great because as soon as you push this, it takes just like maybe in my case, like three seconds, five seconds at most to push uh, an interview YAML right into the playground. And I can refresh the playground and see the change. Or if I'm changing like a question that I'm working on, I can just hit refresh like a couple seconds later and Doc symbol already has that that YAML updated right there. And I can almost work on the interview in real time. Um, so that works really well. But the even better part is instead of having to run the command every time, you use the DA watch install, which looks at the folder package that you have running that you have on your machine and it looks for changes. And anytime you save a file, it immediately grabs the change and then it pushes it up. And so you can run the DA watch install with the playground. And so then I can just sit there and every time I press save in VS code on a YAML, I make change, press save, a couple of seconds later, it's live. I can check it right on the server. Um, it works really well. There's one or two little caveats like if you're working on two different YAMLs at the same time, you can't press save, save, because it won't actually push the second change because you have to wait for the server to actually accept the first change and then you press save on the second one. But you kind of get like a, a feel for the rhythm. It really is pretty quick, just a couple seconds, um, particularly if you use the no restart. And that's what lets you push the YAMLs real quick. And then when you edit Py, uh, Python module files, those can take like up to 30 seconds. Um, because the doc symbol has to restart to be able to apply that Python code change. So not usually too bad. Um, when you're working on Python modules, it's kind of nice to do those in like bigger chunks, try to make more changes at once so that you can push it because otherwise that 30 seconds slows you down. But if you're working in the playground, you still have to wait for the server to restart every time you change a module. So that's just part of the system. Um, but that works pretty well. I, Jack, uh, I, I assume you're doing this on... Um... For your dev server, right? Not for your production server? Yeah, so this is all on dev um, because like I said, being just a law firm for us, uh, right now everything is dev um, and internal. And so I'm not, in a lot of cases, I can kind of just break everything at will. And, uh, and so in this case, this is all running on the dev server. I just have it set up. I set up uh, a duck DNS so that I could get to my own server easier. So this machine, my server server is um, running Ubuntu. And then I've got uh, my Docker with the doc symbol container running on top of that. And so what I do is I actually SSH into my server, into my host, and I connect to it. And so that's where the files are coming from, right? Ubuntu SSH. So I'm actually connected to my server just in my home directory. And then I have uh, my doc symbol testing package that I use for like the bulk of my development. So this is all sitting on the server and this whole VS code window is actually connected to the server. So that's why you could see, I can just bring up the terminal, you know, and that's the actual remote machine. So the reason I do that is because then all the files can live there and I can run DA watch install, which is a bash script and needs to be running on some sort of POSIX. So if it can run on Linux, in this case on the Ubuntu, uh, Mac users can run it directly. And then Linux users, obviously, and then Windows. Um, Jonathan has some documentation on the CLI page about running it with uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, which is an option, but not one I've really explored. In my case, since I have access to my own development server, it made sense to me to just keep all my files on the server and then run DA watch install there. And so then I just take my whole VS code window, SSH connect to the server, everything lives here. And then it even keeps track of my open uh, files that I have. And if I close file open, like I can close all VS code and come back later and open it up and it'll come right back to where I was. So for remote connection, it works pretty well. Um, I've even worked on some kind of bad Wi-Fi, and it's pretty robust in that regard. It's also pretty quick because everything that's happening is basically happening on the server. And so, um, you know, the pushes uh, from with DA install to go from server into the container is pretty quick because it's running its own container. Uh, so that's not a bad setup. And then I've got some, uh, I run that, I made it. So 
the DA watch install is running and uh, it just spits its output into a testing log, which for whatever reason, I always have to go through this and it makes the big gibberish at the top, but then it's kind of handy because I can see every time I saved something, <laughs> you can see that it's taken this file. It's like, oh, you changed this one. Okay, I installed it. And so every now and then I can come look at this log file to just have an idea of like, because sometimes you'll look at it and you're like, wait, did my server crash? Or like, did that file actually get pushed? I saved two files too close together. Kind of handy to be able to look at the log without having to keep the terminal open. And every now and then I just purge it when it gets kind of big. But sometimes I'll Jack, forget it. Jack, we've got an like, anonymous comment from you um, or anonymous question for you. Um, uh, this person says, I just started a test file in VS Code. VS Code asked me, do you want to install the recommended Python extension from Microsoft for the Python language? Do you have that installed too? I do. I do use the Python language one. Uh, that is a moat install. So the PyLance, the Python, Python debugger, I just let it install all of them. Um, VS Code wants to put them there. I'm happy for it. I have the GitHub, some of the GitHub stuff. Uh, I also have Rough, which is a really cool linter for Python. Um, it's kind of- Yeah, I'm going to ask become... the dumb question. What is a linter? I'm sorry. The linter is, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's to help clean up your files and your, your Python files. It has kind of a normal standard, like good practices for like how you should organize your code and how long your line should be and how to uh, organize or like display uh like your function arguments and like, are you, uh, it helps you keep track of like, oops, I accidentally returned in this function earlier than maybe I thought. So this other code won't run. I'm, I don't know. I use it, it sometimes. This is like <laughs> the, the edge of my experience. Um, but it can be kind of nice because here's some random functions I have. So like, these are the imports for the functions. And it's like, you know, if I were to, backspace this, you see that like, okay, these all went gray because it broke. And so now all this is gonna work. And some of this could be rough and some of this could be the Python thing, but this is why I install both of them. Um, and so it'll tell you like, oh, this is bad. And so then you know like, oh, okay, if I put the bracket back, then it fixes it. And then like this type ignore, this is for rough because if you don't have it, then it'll be like, hey, I don't know what this doc assemble base util is. Oh, that's from PyLance, I was wrong. But anyway, so it's like PyLance is like, hey, this import's missing. I don't understand what this is. And in this case, like it doesn't know what doc symbol base util is. So then you just put the type ignore. But like it's handy because, you know, here's arrow, which is a Python package that I have installed um, through the, the package management interface on the server. So I know that the package is there. It might be part of the base install. I can't remember. But anyway, the point is it's like, hey, I don't know what this is. And so you can do gotcha. that. And then um, Car else? Caroline asked a question as well. She's wondering, you can still use the Docker symbol playground interface if you want to, right? Yeah, you can use both of them. Um, like I said, I use playground interface to use it for its tools to help identify like, oh, I have an undefined variable that it's tripped across, right? You get that big warning at the top. Um, it's good to search sometimes because you, you can search through all of your different, uh, all your different names. Um, and it has good code examples and stuff. The only problem with using the playground specifically is that um, if you make a change in the playground, it's not applied back to your local files that you're editing in VS Code. So it's not really two-way unless you were to use the playground. And like if you had the playground set up with GitHub integration so that you could actually push your playground package back to GitHub, then you could use VS Code to then pull down those new GitHub changes, right? And then if you wanted to do that, then you're basically just like, it's like yourself and playground self, and you're kind of like two people. And so you're working on both sides of the, the code, right? So you make a change in playground and you push it, and then you pull it down into VS Code and vice versa. Anyway, I was just gonna show you. So rough real quick, you need like format imports. And I click it and it like fixed my imports. It put them back to the way they were supposed to be and made them look all pretty and stuff. So I don't know, that's what rough does. Somebody said, hey, it's good, it's new, it's cool, it's fast. And I was like, okay, cool, seems handy. Let me just throw it in there. 
Um, <laughs> so I did. Anyway, that's my best answer. Cool. Cycle yeah. that included GitHub would take longer. Yeah, it definitely would. I I don't make changes in the playground. I use the playground for its tools, but I don't like edit the code in the playground and then edit it in VS Code or like back and forth. Um, sometimes I will, if I have the playground open or I'm I used it to try to find something, I might make a change, hit save in the playground so I can immediately like test it. And then if I'm happy with like that change, then I'll basically remake that change in my VS Code copy. And then I use my VS Code, and that's the one that I use and I have set up with um, as a Git repo. So I manage it all there, and then all I do is just DA install, push it to the playground. So the playground is really sort of just my like test copy. And the other day I noticed I had a bunch of junk in there. And so I went through and cleaned up my playground because I had old stuff because every time I make a file change, DA watch install will just push the file change up there. And so I kind of let my playground get big and messy because it still works just fine. Um, but I have had one or two times where like I made some big file structure change and I have to go delete stuff out of the playground because it'll be asking a question from an old module that I you know forgot to cut out or forgot to not include or something. But really, if you, if you fix your includes and stuff like that, like you can have other YAML files just kind of floating around because if they're not included in the one you're running, it's not a problem. Um, so that's something that you can do. And then sometimes I'll make a one-off little file, uh, like a YAML that does like one thing, like I have to clear like a cache or maybe I'm messing with like Redis or DA store or something. Uh, sometimes I make like a one question mini interview that basically just like runs some code so that I can like erase a, an extra DA store, clear out some data or like reset something. What do I do to Martin edit? Martin is wondering now uh, how you this what you do uh, to edit your templates with this workflow. Yeah, so that took me a while to figure out a good way to handle. Um, so you can see in this package that I actually have a bunch of templates in here, right? They're all Word docs and some PDFs and stuff. So for that, what I did was there's this nifty program, which opened on the other screen. One sec. Anyway, you can still see it. It's called SSH FS Win Manager. And I can't remember, if you Google that, you'll find it. You might have to install, it might have a, a dependency program that you have to install in Windows. And then this is like a GUI on top. But what it does is you set up the connection and then you can literally SSH connect to your web server. And so then you, and my Zoom thing moves. Anyway, so like here's my actual remote machine, right? So home, Ubuntu, da, 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 da. so it's the same file path that we were just looking at. And I have all my Word documents here. And I can literally just take one of these and what's a good one? Da, 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 da. We'll look at notes here. Anyway, then I can just open it up in Word because as far as Windows sees, this is just a network drive, right? So Windows is treating it as just a mounted network drive and I can edit the files. And then this works the same way with the DA watch install. So I make a change here. I press save in the Word document. The SSH file system pushes that file with SSH up into the server. The server file gets updated with the change I make here because it's just network drive. And then DA watch install sees that my Word document template changed and installs the template change directly into the playground. So I can just have Word open, make my changes, press save, wait for like three to five seconds, and then redo my document generation to see if the change I just made works. So that's quite slick. That makes it pretty easy. And that was the best way I found to handle the Word documents. There wasn't a good way to open them from like VS Code and have them open properly in Word or whatever. So I just mounted my whole file system <laughs> as a remote network drive. And then I edit my Word docs or my PDFs and I can make changes and push them right back just by pressing save. So it's pretty slick. So that makes Word documents easy. There's a little bit of speed problem, as you saw, like it takes just a second to open it up. Um, 
but it's pretty quick and it works pretty quick and it saves back pretty quick. Um, occasionally I'll have some speed problems if I make like a bunch of changes or I like if I drag a whole pile of files in, then it's trying to upload them all at the same time. And then DAWatch install gets confused because like I said, it doesn't handle a bunch of changes all at once. But kind of once you're going on it, excuse me, once you're working through a process, it works pretty well. So, Jack, I'm curious, how, how would it affect your workflow? And maybe, maybe you do this, I don't know, but um, if, if you were building interviews with a team, what kind of changes do you think you'd need to make? Hmm. Yeah, I'm quite fortunate in that, or unfortunate that I'm the only one working on this for me. Um, that would be a good question. I would consider if you were doing that, like, I don't know how well VS Code works for having somebody else edit the file out from underneath you. That is an interesting question. So just a second, let's look. Okay, so we're gonna mess with this just a little bit. Uh, data, questions. No, I was gonna change Z testing. So let's just say that we edit it in Notepad, right? So the same file that we were just looking at. So this one is on the remote server. This one I opened through the SSH. So I'm just curious, like if I make a change here, we'll just do a new line test and we press save on it and that'll push the file. And then VS code by the time I alt tab back saw the file change. So for having a saved file, that works pretty well. I don't know if VS Code has a better way of handling like multi multiple people editing the same file at once. There might be an extension or some other trick for that. Um, but then that's what I would do is maybe have you work out of the exact same file. Maybe that's a way to do it, right? Like kind of a collaborative Google Doc style or use the uh, Git package and you basically work just like it's a software project where it's like, okay, I'm working on this interview, you're working on that interview. And then we both push our changes back and we do a merge uh, for the tree, right? So you make branches and you work on your branch and you merge it back into the tree. That's probably the better, more real way to do it. Um, but that's not a problem I've had to spend a lot of time thinking about yet. So that could work. Um, like I said, this whole thing I do get, and you can see that like the extension is like, hey, wait, you made a change here. Like, do you want to commit it? And then I can be like, no, I want discard change. And then it discards it. So um, yeah, so I have this all set up with Git and then I'm doing it to a private GitHub repo. So you could definitely, um, like I said, do it with GitHub and just treat it as a multi-user. Um, that's probably good if you're working on, in different, like in different YAMLs, um, you're not trying to work on the exact same interview, even then potentially you could, you just handle it with merges. Uh, when you merge the branches back together, you just be like, okay, you edited that question. We're going to keep that change. And then like, I added these new questions down here. We'll merge those changes in. Um, how would that work with pushing? I would probably make sure that each user is probably like working in their own playground or their own playground project because docassemble CLI can push to separate playground projects. You can specify it. Um, it's one of the parameters. And so maybe if you're working on the same server, you push in your own playground or your own playground project. And then that way you can do your own testing. And then you just merge the GitHub branch or merge the Git branches back together. Something like that. Uh, just that. Let me try Jack, to I feel like, I, feel sure like I, I must have been not paying close enough of attention in the beginning, but all of the files that you should, like this, the, the, the YAML file we're looking at now, mm -hmm. the file is living on your server, not on your computer, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah you're editing so all, everything remotely. Yes. So VS Code, okay. this whole VS Code window that you're looking at, this whole window is actually remote. So gotcha. VS Code, it even separates the extension. So it knows which ones I have on the remote. Like these are enabled and are running remotely. And then like this one is running locally, right? So the remote SSH extension uh, lets me do that and tunnels. These are all like built-in ones that you can do. If you click the little guy down here, make a uh, connection and you do connect to host and then you can set it up. 
So there's a little bit of trick to that. You have to put your, um, it'll walk you through it, but like if you have SSH keys that you use to log into your remote server, or if you do username and password, depending on the configuration, uh, it was pretty easy to set it up and you can put your SSH keys wherever you need to, and then you can point at them for VS code. So like I have SSH keys for my server, they live in one place. My VS code uh, remote host configuration knows where those keys are. So those keys are pointed at. And then the SSH file system also I have configured and it's pointing, like it's looking at the same keys. And so I'm using the same SSH keys uh, in this case for both VS code and for my file system, which is really just a second SSH connection. And it's moving all the files over SSH. So that way I don't have FTP or SFTP or anything else enabled. Like the server has uh, SSH and then like, so port 22 and then 80 and 443. And that's like the only thing open on the server. And so that just helps keep your machine safer. Um, and then the way this server is configured as a lot of the cloud ones are, like you get SSH keys only with no password. It's no password SSH, which is more secure because somebody can't try to brute force you. So that's where the SSH keys are useful. But VS Code does a good job of handling that and handling the, the setup for it. And then, um, if you use the file explorer, like when you first connect, it'll pop up and be like, there's a button that you can click uh, to open the file system. And then it can just grab your file system right there. And then you can just open the windows and you can do a lot of cool things, right? Like split and group, or you can, you know, open, open to the side. That way I can have two files open at the same time. You can open the same file twice. So like VS Code, this is the kind of thing where like VS Code can be real handy because I can do open to the side and I can be like down here in my function and then I can be up here at this part and I can, you know, make changes. Or in like a really big interview, that's really handy where it's like I'm working on questions and the review page at the same time, but they're in the same YAML file. I can have them open on just two sides. And then when I press save, the whole file gets saved all together. So both both views of the file let me edit two different places at the same time in the same file. So that's handy, like being able to do that and have tabs and stuff like VS Code, I just like a lot. Very cool. Anybody else have questions? Developers using it, multi developers. Yeah, I would say. If, uh, if somebody wants to get started developers. setting up besides installing VS Code, it's. Um... Well, we got a question from Caroline, so I'll, let, I'll do that. Um, she says, can you clarify what it was that we needed to disable Red Hat YAML extension if your colors aren't coming through? And she was able to use her color themes for indented parentheticals with your code, which helps her keep track. I assume you guys did uh, some work together on getting the yeah, code letter working. We did. I don't remember exactly what we did to solve it, but the trick was, it's probably better not to have the Red Hat YAML extension installed if you're using the doc symbol extension, because it seemed like there was some conflict in terms of like the YAML or the Red Hat one trying to kind of override or it was messing with some of the, the syntax highlighting. So we ended up disabling that. And then there was an option. There's an option in your settings file. which I can't remember. That's not it. How do I? There you go. Um, so in here, there are, so VS Code has a whole bunch of like special settings that you can control and manipulate and like the way that it handles scrolling and file associations and color schemes and all sorts of stuff. Uh, like for instance, here's what I was saying, font ligatures. This is to get the italics with Cascadia mono is you have to set these font ligatures. You have to come in here and put these codes in. But um, one of the things that you can do in here is you can actually set colors for like bracket pairs and stuff like that. And that's what we ended up doing for Caroline was having to come in here and uh, changing 
some of the colors you can set specific, like I think hex colored codes for different brackets um, that act as overrides. And so we came in here and we set up some, she had a, a particular color scheme she liked for her parentheses and the way that like nested parentheses or nested brackets work so that she is familiar with like what level of it, um, of bracketing that was based on the colors. And so we were able to put those colors in and they acted as an override to her theme. Because otherwise those colors, I think, are driven either by the theme or by VS code at its base. Yeah, Caroline's theme for parentheses gave a different color. So yeah, like my brackets have different colors when they're nested, but not not like she had, like I think it was like, <laughs> yeah, see these start repeating the colors after a while. And I think she had a longer list of colors before they're repeating. So that, that was better for her. Uh, I spent two days discovering a solution to problems with disappearing code exe file in VS Code directory. Automatic updates. Well, that sounds annoying. I'm sorry. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I just installed VS Code and I let it update itself and I've never had a problem with it. Well, if there are no more questions, um, if there are more questions, throw them in there now. Um, but if there aren't any more, Jack, thank you so much for all of this. My uh, head's a little bit full with how to get this all set up, but. Um, I'm well, sorry, I, I kind of jumped around a bunch. Um, no, it's okay because, but it's it's all there and I'm, <laughs> I'm thrilled and now I'm excited to sit down and try and figure it out for myself, so. Yeah, let me see. There were a couple other things I wanted to look at. Um, Oh, yeah, I made a, a DA watch read me. This is a little handy note to me. So this was just like, uh, this is why I run in my terminal in order to get DA watch install to work. So it's like DA watch install playground file path to my folder that is my package. And then this basically says take the output and then save it here. And then and disown means it disconnects from the terminal. So this is how I'm making that log file that I was showing this guy. So it's like in order to get this to work and see, so you can even see the changes we made earlier applied. Um, when you run this in the terminal, if you don't do this and you just run this part, which is the only required part, then it'll actually stay in your terminal as like, you know, as like a running program. And then you can't use your terminal or you'd have to make like a new one, right? And so the trick there is to do this to output to a log file and then disown so that it releases it. And then that way my DA watch is like running in the background, like literally 24 seven in part because it's dev server and the server sitting in the cloud and it just does what it needs to the whole time. So DA watch can sit there and it doesn't do anything until I make a change to the files. So being able to disown it and just let it run in the background is fine. And then if I need to like kill it or rerun it and it's been fine, but I really haven't had problems with it. And since I'm primarily just working in the same package, like all the time in the same playground, I haven't had to like make a bunch of changes. Yeah, there you go, Caroline. There's your colors. So that's how you set up the different uh, editor bracket highlights is what Caroline put in the chat. What size is my server? Not sure what you mean. Uh, so this, I can show, I have to find the link. I'll try and find the link and paste it somewhere or something. There's um, There was a guide on how to set up uh, a server to do DocSymbol server on Oracle Cloud. And I know a lot of people kind of hate on Oracle and that's fair because uh, sometimes they do garbage things, <laughs> but they have a pretty generous free tier. And so I am using their free tier for my dev server. And so it's, uh, the tricky part is it's running on ARM. And so that means you have to build your uh, Docker container images, like both of them, the OS and the uh, doc symbol. So like if you look up here, I've got my doc symbol and doc symbol OS. And so you have to build both of these. Um, there's a guide I found online. Somebody linked it in the Slack like a long time ago at the beginning of this whole process. And uh, so that would have been, I don't know, November, December last year, something like that. Anyway, 
uh, really handy guide on how to set up and use Oracle's free tier. And so it runs on ARM and you get like four virtual CPUs and 24 gigs of RAM on a free tier, which is pretty massive. Um, but they have kind of limited availability. <laughs> and so sometimes the regions and domains can be tricky to get set up uh, or to find one where you actually like have access. Um, but it's pretty handy and is quite a robust uh, remote server. Yeah, Slack doesn't go back that far. I'll try and find it. I've got, I know I have a bookmark somewhere. Uh, cool. Well, Jack, thank you so much for walking us through all this. I really appreciate it. I am kind of excited to get I myself set up on VS Code for interview building. That's pretty awesome. Um, so, really appreciate it. Shout out to this dude. Um, what's his name? I don't remember what this guy's name is. Anyway, it's on this blog, Law Techno. Shout out gotcha. to this dude. He has a whopping one post on the blog, and this thing was super helpful. <laughs> so anyway, he's a boss. Um, but yeah, so I just followed his whole guide to set up this, um, and I'm glad he did it because Oracle Cloud, like the web interface is super confusing. I Not that I've used a lot of AWS or anything else anyway, but just like jumping through, especially setting up like the network configuration and stuff for it is kind of crazy. Um, he even shows how to set up like S3 storage on Oracle if you need that, uh, which for me, I'm not using. I just use Docker volumes for my backups. Um, but again, that's just from like a dev, a solo dev environment. Um, S3 might be more useful. That might be a better way to handle some of the multi interviews or the packages or something. Um, I'm not really sure. I will anyway, include yeah. that link in the in the notes on the show. So, yeah, that guy rocks. That guy has been awesome. So, yeah, I've been using this Oracle server. Um, they did shut it. Like all they did was just turn the server off. They sent me an email like, "Hey, we're gonna turn it off in three days." Um, and so I just knew about it. I backed up my server, which was fine. I didn't need to. But the important thing was shut down my doc symbol before they were gonna shut down the whole server. Um, because it's technically a VM, right? And so I just uh, shut down my server and then five minutes, not even five minutes after, like they shut it down, I just hit start again and it fired right back up. Um, so that's, like I said, that's a limitation of a free tier. <laughs> uh, but just something to keep in mind is that like, it does have some limitations like that and you just have to keep an eye on it. But they sent me an email like a week in advance that they were going to do it with the exact like date and time to the, the hour they're like all right nine o'clock on next tuesday we're going to shut your server down because you didn't use it enough um anyway small price to pay for what's otherwise been a great server but yeah having to build the the images um on arm it's not hard the instructions explain how to do all of it it's just kind of slow um was that ryan who wrote it well that's cool Anyway, like I said, that's the only blog, the only post on the whole blog, and it was super awesome. So big yeah. shout out to that. Uh, and then let me see, any other things? Oh, for the DA watch. Sorry, I had the readme in terms of how I run the command. Um, you follow the instructions, it'll make the stock symbol CLI. This just stores like your API key and stuff for the uh, DA install. So I'm not going to click on it because it has my API key in it. But one thing I did run into when I was trying to get this to work was I had problems with my Python path because DA install is actually a Python module, uh, but DA watch is a batch script. So you come into your bash RC file, which is like in your user. And so this has a bunch of like bash settings, right? Which is your shell, uh, your Linux shell. And I had to add the alias for Python and pip to the actual uh, executables. And then I had to add the executables. Anyway, I had to add this to the path. And so by doing this to the path and this to alias, and maybe I didn't need both of them. And then you see, I tried to like do this and I didn't need to do that and whatever. So you might need to mess around just a little bit with your paths or alias or whatever to make sure that DA watch like can actually grab what it wants. Cause the way the bash script is written, I think it just reaches for Python. And so if Python isn't specified properly. It doesn't know where to find the actual Python executable or the pip executable. Um, 
So like I said, a little bit of messing with this. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer or try and follow up. Um, this was trial and error, and this might not even be, you might not need all this. This is just one of those things like, hey, I ran into that trouble and I was trying to remember it. So we've got that. And then what else do I do? I don't know. That's most of it. But yeah, so nine times out of 10, just during the day, like I'm not even looking at any of the rest of this. These are scripts to start and stop my Docker containers, right? So I make sure to have like the 600 second shutdown and stuff. <laughs> so I just made a script to make sure it's like, okay, named container, like shut it down safe. Um, these are just like all handy things for me. Because a lot of this is sort of like, I use VS Code, but then also having like, admin the server at the same time like I have a little bit of experience but a lot of this is kind of learn the whole thing all at once uh from the fire hose and so <laughs> there's a lot of learning process along the way and little little things but yeah nine times out of ten my day is just sit here with my yamls open and you know work through and work on my modules like I said some static stuff not have any sources so that's fine and then the modules but yeah so I just sit here and then this package is all set up and it's just being DA watts the whole time. And I sit here and I work on the interviews and I've got my browser window open on the other screen and I'm just going back and forth trying to make stuff work. As you guys see me in the Slack, always asking weird questions or getting confused at something silly and not realizing something and forgetting to read, you know, the fourth page of documentation or whatever the case may be. But uh, it's a good learning experience. I really don't. I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. So I guess I'm just trying to say like, kind of embrace that because so much of this has been like, I don't really know. I just sort of threw it together and saw what stick. Um, like Quentin's question about rough or whatever. It's like, I, I don't know exactly. It does some things that lets me format the document. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't like it. Uh, it's all kind of just trial and error. Um, and there's a lot of parts of it that I don't always know and you just, Keep at it. But yeah, VS Code is just like a part of part of that for me. And uh, it's worked out well. Like I said, a lot of it's just a matter of being able to, to have everything highlighted and be able to look at multiple things all at the same time and have, you know, normally, and this is a bad example because I'm not in the middle of stuff, but normally I'll have like half a dozen tabs because I'm working on different things or I'll have it like split into three columns so I can like, look at the module and like two different EMLs at the same time to make sure I'm setting something up right. Um, and so that's why I like it more than the playground where sometimes it can be a little harder to switch like module to that. I guess you could do it with browser tabs, but um, kind of just having it all here in one place is pretty slick. And then I feel good knowing that like if the whole server explodes or Oracle shuts it down on me, then like I've got everything backed up to GitHub all the time because uh, I push my changes pretty frequently. And I don't know. It works well. It works well for me. That's all I can say. If it works well for you or you're interested, like you should try it. If you don't think it'll work and you like your own workflow, then no harm, no foul. Like I'm not trying to convert you, I just tell you what I like. Well, I really appreciate it. Um... I will wrap this up and we'll get this put up on YouTube. And Jack, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Of course. Yeah, sorry my camera didn't work. I can't figure out what that's okay. No worries. Going on with it. So hopefully that was good for y'all. Thank you so much. It was really helpful. Of course. And, uh, Thanks for the invite.